Now, some of you have probably seen this before. Uh, who's this? Obama. Obama, President Obama. And what, what, what's in his hand? It's a healthcare speech. It's a healthcare speech. So, um, very interesting. President Obama has, you know, <laughs> maybe some of our current, pres our current president has a different approach to things, but, but most uh, presidents, heads of companies, you know, heads of universities, that kind of stuff. When you're representing a bunch of people, you tend to have an army of speech writers, right? That makes that, that you're busy, you give them the ideas, they turn into speech, you take a look at it. And with someone in particular like President Obama that, that paid a lot of attention to his oration and to how he wanted to say things, this was not the first draft of his, of, in, in this case, of his particular speech he was going to give. This was, who the heck knows, 14th, the 14th iteration of the, of the speech or something like that, right? So full-time people working on this, editing, fixing, working, and then check it out. He got it, and check it out. Things are lined out. We'll change this, move this here, and delete that. And what about if we said this, right? That is what Capstone is all about. The worst thing in the world is a blank piece of paper, a blank screen. We don't want blank screens. Much easier to edit, to revise, than to start from scratch. So I, I have, you know, hundreds of friends and hundreds of colleagues and, and all this and that. There's only one guy of all the people, of all my scientists, professional colleagues that I know that uh, would sit there for a day and then two days and then three days and then four days with just his fingers steepled, staring at the screen, just thinking. And then on day five, okay, and then start typing and out would come this basically totally done paper. He's a freak. He's a total freak. He used to be a soccer hooligan. You can't really trust him. He's kind of British. So, um, so he's weird. He's totally weird. Everybody else that I know writes something and then revises it, and then revises it, and then revises it, and then revises it. And that's the exercise you guys need to get into. Just like we want to get bigger biceps, we want to do a bunch of curls, same thing. You got to get in the practice of exercising this muscle, exercising the editorial muscle, right? Is this good? Is this bad? Right? How can I make this better? How can I make this stronger? How can I make this tighter? Right? That's the goal of capstone. And so let's talk about how that process works in terms of producing um, the gold standard for for technical papers, the peer-reviewed papers. Cool. First thing to say is with, with your, uh, your poster is a little teeny bit different because your poster, um, at least in some instances, you'll be in front of. So, so you, you might be able to add in some, some you know, words of your own. But, but if we take the example of a paper, of a written thing, of your thesis that you'll produce at the end of the year, um, with written communication, we don't have any body language. So I can't say the third thing. Right? I can't emphasize that. I can't raise my eyebrows or, or raise my voice or whatever. So we don't have any of those, that scaffolding, that extra help that comes along from, from voice change or, or visual highlighting or something like that. Um, because of that, it can be misunderstood. It can be cited out of context. So we need to work really hard to make sure that it's, it's clear, right? And that, and that it, 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 it is not... Um, taking out context. Now, there'll always be some wackos, some crazy folks that'll try to misquote you, right? Uh, you, you talk to the reporter for half an hour and they use one sentence. And they use like the one that you said, well, it probably doesn't happen that X happens. <laughs> like, well, Dr. Anderson said X happens, you know? <laughs> So that happens. But, but with the ex exception of that kind of intentional misleading stuff, we want to do everything we can to work hard so that it's not misunderstood. It's not cited out of context. Uh, on the upside, written communication allows an extraordinarily high level of detail, at least potentially. Right? Very dense amount of information can be packed in there. Another cool thing about this is that potentially, if I'm talking to you in, in, the, in my, our lecture right here, I'm talking to you right now. Maybe I'm podcasting this, so maybe that's a little weird. But, but, but a piece of paper that I, a paper that I write 
in theory, that has an infinite audience, right? Some of the papers you guys are going to be reading right now are from people wrote, that wrote them 20 years ago, 30 years ago, maybe 50 years ago. You might be reading Darwin, right? My son is uh, my son takes Latin because that's how he rolls, um, and and so he's reading right now in his in his uh, freshman uh, Latin class. They're just starting to read the ancient texts of Rome and, and Greece. So they're they're reading things that were written 2,000 years ago, right? So written stuff is potentially very long lived, right? So that's kind of scary, but that's also kind of kind of cool. Um, uh, we have to write it such that it can be read by itself. Clearly in this day and age with hypertext, with the web, we can really quickly check some of the references, which is a good thing, and you should all be doing that. Right? But it should be standaloneable. Right? It should, it should, it should, you shouldn't have to have other sources to read it and get all the key information. And then importantly, with our scientific uh, f format uh, and our sort of uh, there's a little bit of variance, but by and large our standardized format for these papers, you, the reader, can organize it how you like. So for example, I virtually never, ever, ever, ever read a scientific paper from start to the end. I jump around, I go to this section, go look at that section, and because we have this standardized structure for how these papers are organized, that was essentially hypertext before we had hypertext. That allowed people to jump to the key part, jump back, go forward, go backward, et cetera. And that's really powerful. That's really cool. Now, I just said, ten, you guys are going to give me your first 10 references. These are all valid things for you guys to use in your, in your thesis. But, but, for your first 10, your first 10 have to be peer reviewed. And the bulk of your, of your references, you know, we're talking the end of the semester, end of the year, you know, when we're all said down, we pulled everything together, the bulk of them should be peer reviewed. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean by the, what these first 10 have to be? What do I mean by the bulk of the literature that you're finding? This is what I mean. I've structured this going from the, the gold standard, the best on top, down to slightly less good, slightly less good, to the lowest quality on the bottom. Uh, now, I'm not trying to be dis disparaging any, any source. Any source can be a fantastic source of information. But on first principles, this is what I'm referring to. The first, the gold, it makes sense? Everybody with me? So the best ones, the ones I want you to have, the only ones that are eligible for your first 10 are the white lettered ones here, these, these top four. Okay? So let's go through them. The first one is the standard thing, a research paper in a referee journal. By referee journal, I mean that's been reviewed by other experts and they've guaranteed the, that it meets a minimum standard of quality. They don't say it's perfect. They don't say it's, it's the best thing ever. They just say, ah, this, this is past our smell test, basically. Right? We're going to go over how that process happens in a little bit. But, but first, I'll just say, the first one there is a research paper. That's where you or I go out, Gesundheit, you or I go out and we do some, we collect some data, maybe do an experiment, we do some observations, whatever. We put those the, 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 that new insight into the natural world together in a paper and we send that to a journal and they're going to look at it. The next, another excellent source would be something that's a review paper. Now in a review paper, generally speaking, you and I didn't get anything new. We, we didn't go out and add any new data necessarily. Instead, we read all of the papers that are that were written the last, I don't know, 20 years about octopus. Okay? And we came together and we synthesized the, 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 the current state of understanding of octopus. And and uh, so, so we, we put that together. And that's a, a review paper. That those, particularly at this stage where you guys are, where you're just starting in, you're trying to get what's a feel for the, you know, what does the community understand about this process? Where are we in our understanding of this phenomenon? That kind of thing. Those are fantastically helpful, right? They're, they're going to sort of, it's a cliff note version of the understanding of what's going on. And they're probably going to provide you a lot of references that you can then in turn use in your, uh, in your introduction, et cetera. 
Okay, those first two are pretty common. The next one you guys maybe don't know about, and this is one that's maybe starting to leave, leave the common uh, world. Now, when we first created these references, or excuse me, when we first created these refereed journals, the story was there was a ye old university in that ye old medieval town over there, right? And then hundreds of miles, thousands of miles away, there was another university in ye old, you know, big town over here, right? It was hard to get information to go back and forth. So these these journals were created as a way to for experts to have a centralized place where they could go and see what the learning was. So back in the day, uh, whoever the hell, it was mostly a dude back in the day, but um, went up and, and read this paper and like, what? This is total baloney, right? This is crud. I'm going to write the editor. So that dude got out a quill, right, and a <laughs> dead porcupine or whatever the hell he had, right? And he starts writing, ye paper sucketh, or whatever the technical term is, right? Like a Bugs, Bugs, Bugs Bunny cartoon or something. And, and so I would write to the editor and go, dude, uh, the, the, the Smith 1999 paper uh, was totally erroneous. It, it, it Actually, if you look at the graph figure two, it shows the opposite to what they claimed. Or these guys didn't cite... Uh, uh, Cincinnati 1950, the classic paper in the field, right? Whatever it is. So I would write that to the editor, put it in the mail or carrier pigeon or whatever the hell it was, right? Send it away, carrier skunk or whatever they used back then. So it would go off and the editor would get it. And if the editor found there to be some valid um, uh, uh, critiques of, of whatever it is, the next time the journal came out, the next month or the next quarter, depending on the thing, he might run that letter. And so then, you know, so we have the, usually in most traditional journals, you have a, a research paper section, refereed pep, paper, uh, excuse me, a, a review paper section, and then the letters, usually at the end of the journal. And, and so then I'm reading the paper and I'm like, what? Somebody, that dude just said my paper sucked? I'm gonna get that guy back. And so then I write a rebuttal to, to the editor. It's like, that dude was totally high. Of course I didn't cite Cincinnati 1950, that paper sucked. And all the papers since have shown that it's totally erroneous and it was done with bad data or whatever the case may be, right? And then maybe that's it. Maybe, so maybe I don't even write a rebuttal or maybe I write a rebuttal or maybe the other guy rebuts to my rebut, right? And so it's essentially a conversation between experts. Again, this really was important before we had easy internet, before we had you know, all these great modern conveniences of communication. It sounds kind of stupid, but some of those are some of the best scientific literature out there because you're actually seeing the experts debate the issue, right? And, and you can learn a lot from that, right? Even if one guy is going to end up being wrong, we're, we're looking at the process. All of this stuff we're doing, right? My favorite quote is Einstein says, if we, were knew, if we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't call it research, right? We don't know how this is going to turn out, right? Most of the stuff we do most of the stuff you do is going to not work out. We're investigating. We're blazing new paths. We're, we're trying to figure out the unknown. It's OK to have failure. We build off our mistakes, not just my mistakes, your mistakes. We all build off each other's mistakes. So the idea here is science, this peer review process, is ultimately self-correcting. Right? When we make an error, it, we, we, it might go for a little while, but we, we pretty soon fix it. And so letters are great. So I've only had one letter correspond. I've only had one bout in my papers. It was it was a paper I published on Deepwater Horizon oil spill and wrote this paper with all these people. And then uh, a uh, uh, an oil industry advocacy group wrote back and said, "Oh yes, thanks. This was a great paper, but these guys totally in this case they were talking about dispersants. These guys totally got it wrong on dispersants." So then. I wrote back, uh, well, maybe I, I'm totally willing to say that I might be wrong. But by the way, you're a trillion dollar industry and the evidence that you put in your letter was BS. And I'm a little dude that has no money. You as Mr. Billion Dollar Company, one would think that you would be able to give me more robust data. I'm happy to say I'm wrong if you can go ahead and give me that data. And then they never responded after that, right? So, so I mean, I'm biased in this case, but I think that kind of tells you who was right in that one, right? Um, of course,
course, of course, I would be right, right? Come on, please. So, um, okay, then another one would be a chapter in an edited book. Now, this is not a chapter in a random book. This is a chapter. So some of you, some of you guys were in my class when um, um, Dr. Pallison came up and gave me this book. So this is a book we did on Hurricane mm -hmm. Katrina. And uh, so he's the editor. So I wrote a chapter in this book, okay? So in this case, how these, how these edited volumes work, um, you're typically invited to do it. Invited, to, can you write a chapter on this? And so, so you write the chapter. With any book, you're gonna have a grammatical editor. Somebody's gonna look and make sure, hey, did you spell the words right? Is, is the thing formatted correctly? I'm not talking about that kind of editor. I'm talking about sending it out to peer reviewed, to other people that are gonna look at the content and say, yeah, this is, this is cool, right? That's what, that's what I mean by a chapter in an edited book. Okay, so only those four things are eligible for consideration in the, the highest tier of peer reviewed. So next week, the 10 things you give me, the 10 references should be, should be one of those options. Cool? All right, next best amount would be, say, a technical book. Maybe, let's say, instead of this edited one that, that uh, Dr. Paulson did, maybe he just wrote it all himself. He wrote the book, right? It's just him. In those cases, generally speaking, that's just going to be an editor, a, a, a more traditional, you know, grammatical spelling type of editor that's going to look at it, right? Not peer review people. Uh, a textbook would be below that. Uh, well, it depends. If the textbook has a bunch of editors, in theory, it could be a chapter of an edited book. But generally speaking, textbooks <coughs> probably don't want to use those for this stuff. But the references in the textbook would be, be a good one to do. So rather than quote that, I would go to the source and then quote the source. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Whenever you have a question like that, you want to go to the original source. The only time that ever happens is sometimes, this, this is less and less common, but in real old references, this guy said, wow, the great study of Santa Monica Bay in 1929, right? And you're like, wow, the great study. What the hell study is that? And you can't find it. Right? But it clearly, they have a little table maybe in the paper that's from that. And oh my god, this is exactly what I need. In those rare cases where you're looking for the original source and nobody can find it, either because it wasn't referenced fully, uh, because the, the, you know, the copies were all destroyed, something like that. In that rare instance, what you would do is you would say, you would say uh, Johnson 1929, and, and as much of the reference as you could get from that, that book, as cited in Anderson 1950. So that's how you would do that if you, if you couldn't get to the original one. Uh, okay, so book, next one would be uh, invited paper to conference. So uh, a lot of times when you go to, a, not a lot of times, but sometimes when you go to a conference, um, they wanna do a proceedings. And so I, I might give an oral presentation of the proceedings and they say, hey, you know what? We need essentially, usually what these are, are extended abstracts. So instead of just like a one a one paragraph abstract, which will be in all of the app, all of the uh, the conference proceedings, some folks will actually publish the proceedings as maybe like a four page abstract, right? Not like a full full paper usually, but but kind of the meat of of what you found. Um, and so that would be something that would be okay because those are usually they're not usually uh, evaluated as rigorously as a as a journal, but they pass at least some little muster. Some folks take a, at least a brief look at them. Similarly, a poster at a conference. Increasingly, you guys can find people's posters online, um, which is a great resource. And a lot of times, those could be you know, really good sources for stuff, uh, but not necessarily robustly peer-reviewed. Once we leave that, that uh, part of the world, we get into the next tier. The next tier is basically the gray literature. What do I mean by gray literature? Gray literature would be the... Um, Consulting firm reports, agency reports, stuff like that. Could be really, really good stuff, really great things, but it's not peer reviewed. Similarly, uh, technical web pages, which in the last decade or so have got, some of them have gotten really, really good. I mean, a classic example would be something like um, weather station data, right? Climatological data off of National Weather Service's website or something. If you look really closely, most of those things, you'll look at them uh, and they'll say things like, oh, this data hasn't been you know, ground truth or you know, there's some kind of caveat or whatever. Meaning, essentially, it hasn't been triple checked kind of thing. 
So uh, gray literature, technical web page, book, whatever, all these things are potentially really valuable sources for you guys, and you can use them in your, in your, uh, in your thesis, but I want the core of them to be the white guys, the ones up top here, these, this first core. It's going to really depend on your project as to the exact balance of this. There's no magic number. <coughs> If you're doing something that's, if you're studying the hurricanes right now, right, the hurricanes of 2017, there's gonna be no, probably be no papers or very few papers written on it, right? So you're gonna tend to do more like gray literature, maybe even media reports, right? Maybe even newspaper articles and stuff like that, right? Should that be the core of your stuff? Absolutely not. But maybe that, that newspaper article is gonna tell you the time that the hurricane made landfall, that, that kind of stuff, right? Others of you might be studying a relatively obscure critter or a really relatively obscure system so that, again, you might be defaulting to using a lot of the gray literature of, of some consultant that did a, a survey of that site that they proposed to turn it into houses or something. So they'd done some survey five years ago or something of that nature. You guys with me? All good? Any questions about that, about what, what constitutes a, a killer reference or not? All right, good. So the next question is, let's talk a little bit about the peer review process so you guys better understand this. So why, why do people like me and Dr. Steele and Dr. Patch and we weird folks, why do we publish things in peer review? Why don't we, why don't we just do something like a gray literature? Why don't we just write a report? You know, we done with, we're done with our study, write a report, throw it up on the website, call it good. What do you guys think? What's that? Okay, so Finn says it, it, it doesn't mean anything if we just throw it up there. I wouldn't say it doesn't mean anything. Okay, maybe it means a little, a little less, so credibility. So maybe we get additional credibility when we go to a peer review source, okay, or have it peer reviewed. Somebody else? Right, good. So, so one, we want to disseminate the results, we want people to get the results. The next is, uh, so one is just, just get the information out. Secondly, we might want to, and not, not all scientists are like this, but folks like us that are, for example, worried about management, improving management, working on environmental justice, those kinds of things, we probably want the management to improve, right? We probably want there to be more, a more just society, right? And so we therefore would hope that our information would get out to people as opposed to just live in, a, live in a book on a shelf somewhere that 20 people read. Right? To be clear, a typical basic primary research article, you're talking a dozen people, a couple dozen people maybe read it, right? And the more specific, the more specialized we get, the fewer and fewer and fewer people read it, right? So one of the examples I told, I told our other section was, uh, so one of my professors, Super cool dude, very freaky, would always wear 70s clothes with big butterfly collars and huge honking uh, medallion necklaces. Uh, he was a mycologist, so he studied fungus. And uh, yeah, he always had good you know, cheese and beer and wine and stuff. But, um, <laughs> but one of the critters that he studied was a beetle out on one of the Channel Islands. And he specifically looked at fungus that lived essentially in the armpit of one of the, the digits of this beetle. A specific armpit. Like, that's kind of trippy, right? Um, yeah, the guy did maybe a lot of shrooms or something. But, so, uh, so, but think about that. How many people have the expertise to evaluate the fungal armpit thing of a beetle off the California coast, right? There's some. But you know we're talking <laughs> not a big party, right? <laughs> right? So the more specialized we get, by definition, there's there's probably few. It's, it's probably going to appeal to fewer and fewer folks, and that's okay, right? Knowledge for knowledge's sake, that's okay. As long as it's searchable and findable, at some point when that, if somebody's looking for that, if it's if it's properly referenced, someone will be able to find it, right? So in a sense, that's okay. But for most of the stuff we do, we probably don't want it to just park on the shelf for 50 years, right? We want, we want it to make the water quality better, to make the planning decisions more, you know, more efficient or whatever the case may be. So by publishing it, we get it out. And that credibility that you guys are talking about 
adds, oh man, so okay, so this is in a good quality journal, I can have a minimum level of confidence that this, this thing's gonna rock, that this, that this thing is correct, the conclusions are correct. Um, another reason is just to simply get credit, right? So uh, I got tenure, right? I'm all fat and old, right? Dr. Patch doesn't have tenure yet. Dr. Steele doesn't have tenure. Dr. Reinemann doesn't have tenure yet. They need to get tenure. For them, part of the, the railing they have to climb is they have to publish things. They have to start to become known as people that are experts in the subject whatever. Geomorphology, beach erosion, uh, coastal commission, whatever it is. And so they get that credit, or they, they, they get that, that, that uh, appellation in part by by being a recognized expert. So this, this helps with that. Along with that, that can then help them <laughs> keep their job, right? Which is probably, they probably wanna do that, right? They got babies and kids and things, they wanna you know, feed them. Um, get your job, get your tenure, get you money, right? So another way is, so I want a research grant to study this. Who's gonna be successful getting the grant? Probably people that have a track record of doing work in this area, or at least they're more likely than some random person to to you know, secure that grant. It doesn't guarantee them they get the grant, but that helps. Now, in our industry, which is you know, saving the world, not a lot of money in saving the world, so generally this isn't a problem. But in some disciplines, in particular biotech, in particular computer science, genetic engineering, that kind of stuff, lots and lots of money at stake. The more money that's potentially at stake, for cloning humans, for inventing an insulin cancer drug, you know, whatever the heck it is. When we get into disciplines where there's a lot of money, there tends to be more academic dishonesty. And the need for peer review uh, goes up even higher. You guys with me? So some people will want to publish so that their name gets famous, so when it comes time to start, when the, when the rich guy wants to go clone his cat, and figure out, who do I talk to to clone my cat, right? Peer review, a, 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 a trail of peer review, uh, peer reviewed literature suggests that you're the expert, and so that's going to tend to you're going to tend to get more of the more of the bling there. Yeah. Okay. What makes something a good paper? Ideally, an interesting topic, and hopefully, I think everybody here is going to have an interesting topic. I'm, you got, everybody has talked to me, it's gonna be great, you guys are gonna do a good job, right? But hopefully it's interesting. Um, next, rigorous and scholarly. Those are, those are related but distinct. Rigorous means that if we, if we wanted to see what the effect of, of my new teaching module is on, the, on this elementary school in Oxnard, this environmental education program, I'm gonna wanna make sure I have enough kids that I sampled, right? It's a robust test of this thing. If I, want to, if I have a hypothesis about how the microplastics are depositing across our beaches of Ventura County, I'm gonna to wanna to make sure I've sampled a lot of beaches, I, I have a really good control, all that kind of stuff, right? That's the rigor. And so a good paper is rigorous. Next, a good paper is scholarly. By sco now, there's a lot of stuff going on in our society now that we seem to poo-poo experts, right? It's like, well, you think you're so smart, right? That kind of stuff. Actually, I like the guy that's smart, right? If somebody's about to operate on a tumor in me, I want the dude that knows like the most about tumors, personally. Maybe you don't, but I do. By scholarly, what I mean is, not just that someone is, kind of understands the system, but someone understands the big picture. So scholarly, the meaning scholarly, they, they are like a school, right? They understand all of the literature. So they understand that blah, blah, blah did this study 20 years ago. They understand this study about the physiology. They understand this study about this and that. So someone has a really good understanding of the state of knowledge of this subject. That's what we mean by scholarly, right? So the references don't repeat the same reference over and over every paragraph. Like, dude, this guy obviously didn't do a good job for searching literature. This is someone that has a reference for that statement, a reference for that statement. Or, you know, a different one, right? It's like, oh my gosh, this person really understands the literature, really understands the state of knowledge. Yeah? Okay. Uh, re reproducible. So we give enough information. Now, some of our, some of our, the work you guys are going to do is to be totally reproducible t tomorrow. Other ones, if you guys are studying the effect of, of incredible downpours, the first flush of the year, right? Well, we have to make sure we have a good 
you know, honk and rain that year. So um, maybe we can't exactly reproduce it, but we could be set up so that should that event unfold again, we could reproduce the study, right? So we need to give enough information that anybody can reproduce it. Now, in the case of just measuring some stuff, maybe that's enough to tell the technique. If we're using some very fancy water quality probe to measure the amount of nitrates in the water, I'm also going to want to give the model and you know the make and model of that probe because maybe the the probe that we use in 2017 is accurate to I don't know parts per thousand, but maybe somebody's going to invent a new probe two years from now and that new water quality probe is going to be able to go to parts per million. So I want to make sure that when I do this, I'm very clear that, hey, this is based off of this technology with this capacity, et cetera. So we're really clear about how someone could re choose to reproduce my, uh, uh, your study. Um, ideally, clearly and succinctly written. So the question here comes up, Dr. Anderson, how long is our thesis supposed to be? And the answer is, which you'll hate, is I say, as long as it needs to be. And then you go, that's like BS. Like, really, how long is it supposed to be? And I'll say, as long as it needs to be. And you're like, and then there'll be someone who goes, okay, here's my thesis, one page paper, right? One page, too short. For a year's worth of work, we're talking something on the order of, and this is the final thesis, not end of this semester, but end of the year. You know, you're talking 50-ish pages, something like that. And my point of saying that isn't to say that you need to shoot for 50 pages. You need, it needs to be as long as it needs to be, but it shouldn't be just barfing out crap for the sake of barfing out stuff, right? We want it to be tight. We want it to be succinct um, in communicating that information. And again, that's going to be a practice thing. We're going to revise, revise, revise. Uh, good logical structure, right? So we'll go over the structure in a second. Uh, new insights or management tools will be highlighted. So hey, man, this, this is the new thing that we know that we didn't know before I did my study. That's cool. Do not get depressed if you find out that, oh, uh, if I'm studying microplastics and my hypothesis is microplastics are all over the beaches of Ventura County and I find out, mm, no, no, they're not, right? That's not a failure. That's not a bad project. We now know that. That's cool. So, so even in your, sometimes you guys think it's a failure, we know something new. We know that that's not the case. That's important too. Uh, and then lastly here, really good papers inspire the next steps, right? So uh, you know, go to hear a talk at a conference, person finishes the talk, hands up, I would, hands up, yeah, no, wait, so whoa, 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 you said that the fish are gonna be fatter when they eat this algae. I don't think that's right. And you, know, and you might see that from the outside and you might look at that and go, oh man, dude, that guy totally screwed up. There you go, you're having a dialogue. That is awesome. That is science in action, right? I'm inspiring this guy to say, dude, you're totally high. I think something else is happening. That's how we grow. That's the mark of a good talk. The mark of a bad talk is I give my talk, questions? No questions at all. Either I've, I'm so incredibly brilliant, I've, I've dumbfounded them all, which will never happen, right? Or more importantly, they're like, well, that's pretty stupid. I mean, we already knew all that, right? So good stuff inspires the next step. It, it, it makes it obvious, or, or it should be pretty obvious, oh, we should then go try this on whales. We should go try this on elephants. We should go, you know, that kind of a thing. So we want to, we want to be talking about the next step. Don't feel like your study needs to solve every single thing there is about environmental injustice in the world or whatever it is, right? You're gonna just be one peg, and that's gonna lead us to the next peg, and the next peg, and the next peg. Cool? Questions? Okay, here are the parts of our research paper. I should say that, that this is generally, these are, these are generally the parts of research paper. Some journals will sometimes blend a part or two, but by and large, these are, these are pretty standard components. Title, this is gonna, uh, it's obvious, it's gonna say what the study's about. Authors, it's then gonna list the authors. So the first author is the person, generally speaking, that did most of the work, that did, that orchestrated it, that did the writing, all that kind of stuff. And then, if there's more than one author, it goes in, generally speaking, progressive order of who did less and less and less. A couple exceptions here. One, um, uh, 
one of the most important persons, oftentimes, at least if it's in some kind of university context, is the last author, which sounds kind of weird. So the last author is usually the person's lab that the study was done in, or the sort of the overseer kind of person, right? So, uh, so first author is the one that you're going to correspond to. If you have questions, if you want to follow up, that's the person you want to email. And when we talk about the peer review process in a second, that's the person that's going to shepherd the paper through the peer review process. Um, let's, okay, the one exception is every once in a while you'll come across a paper, and let's say there's three authors, and it's you know, A, B, and C. Every once in a while you'll see an asterisk that says, all three of these authors contributed equally to this work. We couldn't decide who would be first author, so we flipped a coin. So sometimes you'll see something to that effect, meaning that everybody was equal, but by and large, you, you read off level of effort from, from left to right. Okay, next, next part is the abstract, the generally speaking one paragraph summary. What they did, what they found, what the key conclusion was. Uh, as a rule of thumb, when you're first starting this, suck out one, maybe two sentences from each of the subsequent sections of the paper. A sentence or two from the introduction, sentence or two from the methods, sentence or two from the uh, results, etc. cetera. And that, that's, a, that's a good starter. If you're not trying to start, that's a good starter way to, to, to begin your abstract. Now, if people are going to read anything about your paper, they're going to read the title. If they're going to read anything else about your paper, they're going to read the abstract. So those are the two most important things because those are what's going to, going to act as the advertising to bring people in to read the full content of your work. Um, we also have keywords. I'm not talking about those yet, but we also have keywords that help people find it in, in a search context. Okay, then we start the introduction. The introduction is what you guys are working on this semester. This is what you're going to be turning in at the end of uh, your first semester. So the introduction is basically going to say what the problem is that we're concerned with, outline the current state of understanding of this, set up the problem. It's going to go from generally broad statements or broad concepts down to the specifics of your test. It should conclude with your hypothesis, your central hypothesis, or in some cases, your, your one or two hypotheses. But you're going to say what I'm trying to test, what I'm trying to explore. Yeah? Next, and this is for next semester, but just for completeness, next we have our method section. This is what you did, exactly how you did it. The results will be your, your, your data, what you found the numbers, the results of the statistical test that you did to see if these two populations are different from one another, et cetera. Um, generally, no, no interpretation other than, you know, I, I disproved the hypothesis or something of that nature. The discussion is where you really start to get into what does this mean, right? So because I disproved this hypothesis, this means that X is apparently happening in this system. And the discussion is going, and, and so in many papers, the discussion is the end, is the last uh, meat section of the paper. In some, pa in some uh, journals, they will have, and you guys are welcome to do this if you want to, some uh, layouts will have a separate conclusion section. This will be very brief, usually just a paragraph or two, kind of summarizing the discussion, essentially, summarizing what you learned. But in most cases, the conclusion is built into the end of the discussion. And again, this is going to take it back out. If you haven't already done the discussion, this is going to take it from we, in the inter intro. We started broad, went narrow to our topic. Here we're doing the reverse. We're going from narrow back out to broad implications of what it means for the wider world. Next, there's going to be an acknowledgments section. The acknowledgments section is where um, we're going to give credit. Now this is this is this can be an important place for figuring out maybe why someone did the study. So this will say things like this work was done in partial or to in partial fulfillment of the requirements for a PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles, or something like that. 
uh, it might say, you know, thanks to all my friends that helped me out with this, right? My lab assistants, that kind of stuff. It should say, if anybody funded this work, most funders will require that you acknowledge them in your, in your publications. This is where you would do that. So this, this work showing that oil has no effect whatsoever on dolphins is funded by Exxon, right? That kind of thing. So not that you should be completely skeptical of somebody just because of who funded it, but <coughs> it, might, it might raise your level of skepticism a bit if, if it seemed like there was a potential conflict of interest in the funders, right? Uh, okay, then our references. Again, this is when I was in your guys' stage and, and you know, before we had all this stuff in PDF, I have to go to the library to Xerox all the papers and I didn't have a lot of money, so I was always Xerox the title and the body of it and then you know, the very first page of the references and that would be ending. And I did that for a while until I started realizing I needed those references. You know, I had the Anderson reference, but the, the Zinke reference, I didn't have that. I have to go back to the stacks, look it up. So you want to keep those references. You want to have the entirety of your paper. Those are gold mines. That's that that in your detective work process. That's how you're going to find jump to the next lily pad of information and keep following the source to its to its origin. Um, now, in most papers traditionally, that's where things ended. Increasingly, in today's day and age, the we've seen the rise of the appendices, the rise of the supplements. Back in the day, since most journals were physically printed. Rarely did people have extensive appendices or, or supplements. But now, because most of these things are published electronically, you essentially, is, there's no cost. So you could have an extra 10 pages at the end or something of that nature. The appendix is where uh, you're going to take stuff that either really bogs down the reading. So you might summarize the mathematical model in your, in your methods, but you might have the full detailed 20, 20 pages of the code or something in the appendix. So again, if somebody else wants to repeat it, they have all the information there, but that they don't really need to read through it. For you guys, let's say you do a public opinion poll. Let's say your, paper, your, your study uses a public opinion poll. You're going to summarize that. You're definitely going to summarize how you did your survey and all that, and maybe list some of the key questions. But you wouldn't include the, include the poll itself. But that's a perfect thing to include in the appendix, right? Because then if somebody wants to repeat it, they can see exactly how you worded every single question how, you know, which, which answers you gave first, that kind of stuff. Maybe you did a lesson plan. Maybe you did, you're maybe doing an environmental education capstone and you want to include the lesson plan, perfect place for that in the, in the appendix, right? So again, if somebody in the future wants to repeat it and they find your paper, it's all contained in there. It's all, it's all good to go. 